Coming up, how to determine your next career move. And then the secret overemployment trend continues to grow. And you know I'm going to coach you up. If you're ready, I'm ready. Let's go. Coaching you to have the competitive edge to win in your work so that you can win in your life. More money, more meaning, more income, more impact. That is our focus. So it was, uh, well, let's see, 15 years ago. I was in a season of confusion, a season of discouragement. I knew only one thing, that I wasn't where I wanted to be. And yet I had no idea where I wanted to go. Now, you want to talk about just a, a sucky place to be, that's it. I'm not where I want to be, but I couldn't give myself a clear alternative. I could not envision a clear alternative. It was just, I know I'm not on the path that I want to be on. And 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 really what made it worse was that I had envisioned this path that I was on. I was languishing, not moving forward as fast as I should be because I had kind of lied to myself and did not come to grips with the fact that I had been on a path for a while that I didn't want to be on, and I just kind of kept kicking the can down the road and making excuses. Does it sound familiar to anybody? And it caught up to me, caught up to me in my heart. Sleepless nights, agonizing days, boredom, anxiety, discouragement, all the things, right? And I had to at some point go, all right. Are you going to accept mediocrity? Are you going to just stay complacent? Are you going to stay stuck, stale, in a rut? Whatever you want to say. Because on the other side of that decision, to not stay stuck is a whole lot of unknowns, a whole lot of fear, a whole lot of doubt, having to swallow pride. So you're faced with this tough option, right? I'm comfortable. I got a good life. I'm not happy, though. If I dig and I begin to dream again and I map out a, a, a new path, yeah, that's going to be hard. Oh, by the way, I'm in my early 30s. Time is ticking. That's where I sat. And it was a process of six months of, and I don't think it should have taken that long, but I was wading into the water, so don't judge me. I was slowly wading out, and it took me about six months of self-discovery and looking at some threads in my life and looking through some past stories of my life and, and examining, well, what led me to go down this path and then what caused that to no longer be the path? I had to confront that and dig deep. In other words, it was a deep dive of awareness of where my heart was, where my head was, where I was in my life, my financial situation, my family situation. I mean, I had to look at the whole thing. It was almost like, it was like if you've ever cleaned out your garage before, you ever cleaned out your garage, guys are shaking their head. That's a process. And I have found that the best way to clean out a garage or a storage facility is to drag everything out. Drag it all out, take a look at it, and go, all right, what are we keeping? What are we throwing away? All right, if we're keeping it, where does it go? How should I organize it? How can we do this better? And that was the exercise, not having any theories, not having uh, a whole lot of tools other than some advice of some executive coaches who I was friends with and they gave me some of their tools and some of the things. And so I went through the hard work of self-discovery. So today I wanted you to hear that I have been where you are. It is agonizing. But if I can, I want to encourage you and equip you with just a few practical steps that you can take to determine your next best career move. Maybe the last move, meaning it is a movement. We are beginning to move. We are charting out on a new course. Now, can I just be fair and honest here? 
I didn't have the tools that I can offer you today. I didn't have what I have now is on the other side of this experience, and now I can coach you. I didn't have it. But I can tell you that I stumbled and bumbled and my and drug myself and crawled and ran and tripped all the way through what I'm about to teach you, which is first. You must ask yourself, am I clear on where I ultimately want to be? Now, we're talking professional, but this is a wonderful construct that can work for you in your personal life, spiritual life, physical life, emotional life. Am I clear on my mountaintop? And I love using the mountain as the analogy. Is Can I see out into the distance of my future life? And can I see a very clear mountaintop, a goal, a vision of that goal attained? Number two, you have to then say, after we determine this, by the way, these are the questions you must dig. By the way, these are not sometimes, very few times are these answerable in a quick in a, in a quick moment. Am I clear on where I want to be? After I answer that, I must then say, what is it going to take to get there? What's it going to take? Experience, skill set, money, time, friends, connections. Once I figure out what it's going to take to get there, now I've assembled a, a list, if you will, of, of what I'm going to need. I can sit there and look at it and go, okay, in order to climb this mountain, this is what's going to have to take place. Third, who can help me? Who can help me climb the mountain? Who can help me get there? Who's the guide? Who, who are the compadres, Right. Uh, who are the soul sisters, right? Who's going to walk with me and climb, help me climb, whatever that looks like. Incidentally, when you begin to ask this question, who can help me get there? One of the things you're going to find is there may be some people in your life you need to cut out. It's true. It's a harsh reality. Because you get some people who will accidentally discourage you. They mean well, but they keep every time you're around them, they just keep making you doubt what you're doing. Next, fifth question, where do I start? What's the best place to start? There's no perfect place to start, but there's always a best place to start. Where do I start? I, I, I know the mountain I want to climb. I know what I got to do to climb it. I know who I want helping me along this journey, but now where do I start? What's that first step? Identify it and take it. And finally, the fifth question, how do I continue to advance up the mountain? What does advancing and climbing look like? What do I need to do to keep growing, keep training, keep getting more knowledge, more wisdom, more connections to keep moving up? This is from my journey. Now, I created a great tool for you, the Get Clear Assessment, that'll help you with question one. Am I clear on where I want to be? You can go to KenColeman.com, search the Get Clear Assessment. It's only 30 bucks. Take it 20 minutes, and it's going to begin to help you identify the mountain. The book from Paycheck to Purpose will walk you up the mountain, helping you answer many of those questions that I laid out for you today. But here's the deal. These questions, am I clear? What's it going to take to get there? Who can help me? How, where do I start? And how do I move up? These are the questions you must ask and answer. Coming up, quiet quitting? It's not the new trend. We'll talk about the new one. Did you know that just like a product, you have a personal brand? It's the image or impression others form about you based on your interactions. And whether we realize it or not, our personal brand impacts opportunities to grow in our careers. That's why our team created the Personal Brand Survey. It's free and it will give you personal and professional feedback so you can own your strengths and uncover any blind spots holding you back. To get started, go to kencoleman.com slash brand. Welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show of the people, by the people, for the people. I uh, Keeping you up to date, warning you, guiding you, coaching you, cheering you on. Um, quiet quitting has been quite the work trend, right? Everybody's talking about it. Um, 
But a growing trend is now being called overemployment. In fact, there's a website, overemployed.com. Um, and this is from an article uh, from the CBC. It's a Canadian uh, paper, but they uh, reference a lady by the name of Mary, they're calling her. And she needed to she needed to offset the rising cost of living. And instead of working overtime, she thought, wait a second. Um, what if I get a second full-time job in their field, um, in her field? And uh, she and her partner both did this, and they didn't tell either boss about it. So this is a growing trend. We've actually talked about this on the program. Um, and it, it it's it's fascinating. In fact, you know what? I got I'm going to do something here. Uh, throwing a curveball at Alex. I want to go to this website and just see what it what it says and what it looks like. You know, it just occurs to me. Overemployed.com. Now, I am not in any way endorsing this website. All right, uh, and we're going to keep covering this. Okay, so this is the website, Alex. Overemployed.com, and right off the top, it says work two remote jobs, reach financial freedom. So it talks about his story, and I just wanted to see how this is. Boy, this is just this is just straight up. Talks about the financial independence, retire early movement, which they call fire, um, and uh, it's generally a job board. Um, this got some success stories, multiple remote jobs, how you do it. Okay, so I just wanted to take a look at it. All right, so the founder of this is a guy by the name of Isaac. He doesn't give out his last name. Um, and he is a victim of what he thought, or he was going to be a victim of layoffs that were coming in 2020. So he started thinking about his exit plan. And I love that. If you feel like a storm is coming, prepare for the storm. We've talked about that many times on this program. So what happens is he uh, several months trying to get a job, and he finally gets a job offer. But the but since he never got the layoff, he had been juggling both jobs, kind of thinking I'm going to lose my my first job, so I'm going to keep this second job going. And he figured out how to do it, keep it going. And so then he goes, well, why in the world would I quit it? So instead of the trend of quiet quitting, which is people engaging in just the bare minimum that's required, now you got people who are signing up for two jobs, the overemployed life, and they're moving closer towards burning the candle too close, right? And 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 and, and you know, moving towards the risk at least, if not a guarantee of burnout, right? Um, there's a thriving community on Reddit that is also devoted to this movement. Um, in fact, uh, we actually showed a video recently, um, and I commented on a prominent YouTuber who documented his experience in getting caught working two jobs. And you can see that on our YouTube channel. Um, and I don't know what is that, is that titled anything specifically, or they just search our channel. Guy gets caught working two remote jobs. You can see that, um, and I comment on it on our YouTube channel. Um, now, there aren't any exact numbers right now on this trend. But Anthony Lutengegger, or Lutenegger, boy, I hope I didn't butcher that too badly. Um, he is also Canadian and head of a business development, a head of business development at a technology company called Aragon Labs. And he said it's clearly a growing, a growing trend, especially in technology. He said the reason you're seeing it pop up more now, we're talking about two full-time jobs being held down by one person uh, is because of remote work. You couldn't do that as easily if you're in the office. And I think that that's pretty obvious. I, I guess I wouldn't put anything past anybody. But the, my hunch is that the only way you can pull this off is if you're fully remote. I don't know how in the world a company could be so incompetent, but here I say that, and it's possible, where somebody could be I guess in a hybrid model, you might be able to pull it off too. But I think it's almost exclusively remote. So you're working two jobs. Um, now, um, there are risks. And I think that you have to consider the risk. And then you have to also understand that what you're doing, it's, it's unethical. I mean, I don't know how else to say it. And I don't want to be, you know you know, the school marm, you know, tisk tisk, you know, but you know, they, they quote an employment lawyer, 
um, in in that article, plus a Fox Business article that I'm looking at, uh, of saying, look, um, it may not be expressly written in your employee agreement because see, people are going, well, look, when I sign my contract, my employment agreement with one with the first company, it doesn't say anything in there that I can't hold down another full time job. <laughs> okay, fair. It, but if you ever heard of the phrase "the spirit of the law," I mean, really? I mean, who really thinks that a that a normal, healthy leader and or leadership group of a company are fine with people pulling down or holding two full time jobs? Now, I guess the only caveat to this is is if you're working, you know, eighty hours and you are fulfilling what is required. But no one can do that for very long at all. You just can't hold that up. That schedule's not, it's just not sustainable. So let's just be honest. This is unethical. You're cheating on both companies. You're not telling them you're withholding this. And, and, and I, I, listen, I will also recognize that very few people actually work a full 40-hour week. Okay. Now, people that are working overtime, I get it. But most people who are who are doing a, a traditional 40-hour week job, if you take your lunch hour and you take uh, the amount of time that people waste during the day, which is probably somewhere between 90 minutes to two hours, you know, goofing off, talking, scrolling social media, uh, you know, whatever. Smoke breaks, the whole nine yards. Do people still do smoke breaks? I think they do. Oh, they, I know they do, actually. There's a company in our office park, I shall not name them. But what's funny about it is they're in healthcare, And there's always these same ladies out smoking a cig every morning when I come in. I'm thinking to myself, huh, do you want to go? Well, never mind. That's a rabbit trail. All right. What are the risks? What are the risks of this overemployment trend where you're working two full-time jobs? I, I read all the articles. There's not a whole lot of data on this. So we've got some common sense stuff here, just based on the, the anecdotes and, and and the evidence that I'm seeing. I think there's three things. I think, and, and again, by the way, the umbrella that I just mentioned is a risk, but I just think this is unethical because I don't think it's right. And 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 so this leads to what I think are the three risks because it's unethical, and I don't think it's healthy. First is a health issue. Multiple testimonies in these articles I reviewed for today's show said, said uh, that quoted people that said that they were stressed out all the time and anxious because they were always worried that today's the day they get caught. I mean, who wants to live that way? I remember one time when I was a kid watching some bank robbery movie, and I'll never forget, I remember watching it going, man, that seems kind of cool. All that money would be great. But is the money worth it when you spend your entire life looking over your shoulder? Some of you are going, yeah, it is. I don't buy it. And so anxiety and stress from trying to hold down two jobs, please two leaders, two different customer bases, stress and anxiety is, is a major risk here and what it can do to you. Secondly is the next level, which is just a sheer amount of hours and work and that the, the anxiety and the overworking and all that kind of stuff, presumably if you are overworking, it leads to burnout. And you're fried. You may have more money, but what did it cost you? Your mental, emotional, and physical health. It's not worth it. The third risk is getting fired twice. Nobody talks about that, except we showed in that YouTube video, both companies ended up finding about each other. That could happen. Now you get fired twice. Who wants to put yourself at that kind of risk? It's not worth it. This is the Ken Coleman Show. So you just landed the new job. Congratulations. You've made it past the interviews and now it's time to onboard with excellence. That's why I created How to Stand Out at Your New Job. This free checklist will help you succeed from day one and may even help you get promoted. These practical steps set you up to add value, help your team win, exceed your leader's expectations, and ultimately set you up for a successful transition. To get started, just go to kencoleman.com slash new.
of the people, by the people, for the people. I'm here to help you win in your work so you can win in your life. A uh, couple of comments I've got to address in the YouTube chat room. We have people watching live on YouTube right now, calling the YouTube crazies. Every once in a while, we get somebody new in. And we've got a new person in today who uh, needs to be set straight. So that's coming up in 30 seconds. First, Ralph Mendoza, one of our chief crazies, has a question based on our last segment. As I was talking about uh, being overemployed, holding down two full-time jobs, uh, he says, Ken, I'm genuinely cur- curious is having a side gig outside of work cheating your employer? No, it's not. Unless it is a conflict of interest. All right? So let's say you're in the same industry and you are, um, it's a conflict of interest. Let's just leave it at that. That's pretty clear. Everybody understands that. But having a side hustle and extra work outside of your full-time job, no, it's not cheating on your employer. Now, we got somebody new, at least new to me. I've never seen them before. Pulpus Simplex said, Ken is such a company man. He hates workers. I'm going to just offer that up to our uh, YouTube crazies who watch the show every day. Why don't you all correct Pulpus Simplex and help him with a bit of a history lesson of the Ken Coleman show? Uh, I will simply say that uh, you've not watched this show for any length of time at all. Uh, I am constantly talking about bad bosses and horrible leadership and systemic problems in corporate America and working culture today. Constantly. And I am always here for the average man and woman, the excellent man and woman, the below average man and woman. I don't care where you're from, who you love, what you believe, how you vote, what color you are. I don't care. I believe that every person was created to work, to contribute, and I'm here to help you do it. And uh, you just don't watch the show. So um, if you had some problem with what I just said there on it's being unethical to work two full-time jobs, then you have some ethics issues. But if you can hold down two full-time jobs and both companies know about it and you're not lying, it's no longer unethical. I'll leave uh, you, Pulpa Simplex, to watching the rest of the show. And um, pay attention to what I'm about to discuss. There you go. All right. Factory jobs are booming in the U.S. This is great news. This is fantastic news for a lot of reasons. Pay attention, Pulpus Simplex. Since American manufacturing entered a long stretch of automation and outsourcing in the late 1970s, Every time we've gone through a recession, we've seen factory jobs suffer, and they didn't come back. However, this time is different, and it's fascinating. We're going to break it down and why it's good news. Okay, Since the pandemic recession, okay, American manufacturers have added enough jobs to regain all that they shed and then some. Now, what's different this time is that the gasoline, if you will, the fuel behind this manufacturing recovery includes pharmaceutical plants, craft breweries, and this is fun, Joe, ice cream makers. I'm there. I know. I love good. I love I love some ice cream. Um, newly created jobs are more likely to be not in the Midwest where we've seen strong manufacturing jobs. This is very interesting. Now it's in the Mountain West. And the Southeast. So this is where we're seeing the greatest growth of manufacturing jobs. Not the Great Lakes in the Midwest is where we've traditionally seen it. Uh, I think that's really interesting. I, 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 I'm glad that we see a, a recovery in manufacturing jobs. But I, but I will tell you this. I am troubled that it is largely coming from pharmaceutical plants. I think a lot with what's going on in our country has to do with so many freaking drugs we got in our system. I just do. So that that pissed somebody off, I'm sure. You'll get over it. Uh, Amer- American manufacturers cut roughly 1.36, 1.36 million jobs from February 2020. Um as COVID shut down much of the economy and really affected manufacturing. But as of last month, they've now added 1.43 million jobs. That's a net gain of 67,000 manufacturing jobs. That's really good news. Now, 
obviously COVID disrupted global supply chains. And all of a sudden, American companies had to go, we can't get stuff from China. Do Forget geopolitical stuff right now. Forget the politics between the United States and China right now. I'm not, that's not what I'm talking about. Now, that is a factor right now, but back during COVID, it was like China was shut down. They had some very strict COVID policies. It it slowed things down tremendously because a lot of U.S. manufacturing in, in is brought out of China. It's just a fact. Well, now you've got increasing tension between China and the U.S. Our governments are in a very frosty relationship right now. It's very tenuous, to say the least. And so you had American companies going, look, we can't rely on just Chinese manufacturing or, quite frankly, any other international company if we've got interruptions and long delays and higher costs. Um, so that's that's what changed. Delayed div- deliveries, sky-high shipping prices, and other supply chain issues have encouraged American company CEOs to move production closer to home. Businesses are also beginning to question the wisdom of producing so many goods in China. Uh, and so now what has that done? All right. That has created more American jobs. Now, I'm a capitalist. I would never shame any company or CEO from doing international business and cutting their costs. I would never do that. However, geopolitics plus real-time logistics has created a boon for American manufacturing and the American manufacturing worker. And it comes down to this. America should hire Americans. First and foremost, there's nothing wrong with that. Let's create good manufacturing jobs. It's there. It's possible. And so what we're seeing is manufacturing companies are not just raising wages, but they're giving job flexibility, better benefits, things of that nature to lure workers. Now, let's look at, since manufacturing jobs are up, what are the jobs that employers still can't fill? This is very interesting. No shock, it's in hospitality and service work. We're talking things like dishwashers, truck drivers, you know, hotel clerks or whatever you want to call them now behind the front desk, hotel workers, food servers, airport airport agents, home health aides. These are roles that have always had high turnover because lower pay, higher stress, less flexibility with hours. Now, this has always been the case, but what's changed? Well, the pandemic spun off a lot more, a lot, a lot of new jobs rather, and they were a lot more attractive because they can get a better job, which is higher pay and better conditions. Okay. So if you think about it, service workers that were already having hard conditions pre-pandemic, then the pandemic hits and retailers couldn't get supplies, spikes and drops in customer demand, crazier hours, fewer employees to work the hours, burnout, 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 uh, angry customers, Longer commutes, not safer commutes, blah, 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 blah. Okay? So why are they not coming back? A Pew Research survey asked people who quit their jobs about the reason for leaving. Low pay was first, followed by no opportunities for advancement and feeling disrespected. You have a leadership crisis in the service industries and and managers who are leading these lower uh, paid positions and, and companies like Burger King and McDonald's, and I'm not picking on them, just saying you pick any kind of retail fast food if these companies aren't showing people an opportunity for a better life, yes, you're starting now as a cook, but six months, 12 months from now, you can get out of the kitchen. You'll be here. We'll move you up. And you show people an escalator towards progress and growth, not just financially, but in their life. Then they'll stay with you. But these companies aren't doing this. And the days of treating those workers in these industries like just commodities are over. Amazon's hurting. Wake up, leaders. People want to be valued. You were created to fill a unique role through your work, but it can feel overwhelming to figure out what that is. That's why I created the Get Clear Career Assessment. 
In just 15 minutes, you'll get customized results that clarify what you do best, the work you love to do, and the results that motivate you. All this helps you discover what you were born to do. And you'll get a list of professional possibilities to help you in your job search. To get started, go to kencoleman.com slash assessment. Welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show, where we help you win at work and in life. You were created to fill a unique role. You were needed. You must do it. Somebody out there needs you to show up and be the best version of you. So this idea of working on purpose isn't about you. It's actually about others. And oh, by the way, the direct benefit of that is, is you're fulfilled. You're going to make really good money or certainly enough money for you and in your life. And your things like burnout and boredom and anything else you could think of related that's negative to work doesn't exist for you. You create true independence, true freedom from the rules that everybody else has to follow when you are doing what you were created to do. You're always going to have options, whether it's working for yourself or working for somebody else. You can't be held down. Can you be hurt? Sure. You can't be held down. Let's go to Akasio. Acia. Ako. Oh boy. Here we go. Akasia. Akasia. I hope I'm saying that right. In Orlando. You're on the Ken Coleman show. Yes, sir. It's close. It's Akosia. Akosia. Now I've got it right. I'm doing well. How can I help you? Yes, sir. So I'm twenty six years old. I have a bachelor's in um, business information technology. Um, I'm currently working three jobs just so I can pay off debts and, and have money to invest in my business. But mm -hmm. I'm finding that it, it doesn't matter what I do right now. It's just not enough. Mm -hmm. So I've done some calculations. I need a job that pays a hundred K per year so that I can have, um, enough money to invest in my business. And the business I want to get into is Medicare and, um, life insurance. Um, so I'm finding it challenging to find a good company that meets all the criteria I'm looking for. Okay. So I have two questions for you. Okay. Um, I was wondering if you have any recommendations for such a company or do you know any entry level, um, jobs that I can get into that would, um, pay me that amount? Mm, it's very hard. I think we, I, th I love your spunk, but I think you're asking the wrong question. So let me re let me reorganize you and refocus you. How much debt do you have? How much are you trying to pay off in debt? Twenty six thousand. Twenty six thousand. Okay, great. And um, how much money capital do you think you need to start your own Medicare health insurance company that you're envisioning? Um. So I can I can start out with two thousand dollars in leads per month, but that's not ideal because. Those who are very effective in their business, they, they spend about 8000 per month. All right. So you want to get to a point where you're spending 8000 a month to generate leads that you will then convert into this business you're talking about? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. And how much do you make right now with all three of your jobs? What's your income? Um, so with my main full-time job, I'm bringing in $3,000 net. Um, it's 50000 per year. Okay. My side hustles are basically Uber. And I have a skincare business that I'm trying to um, do with my, my cousin. Yeah. So but they're not lucrative at all. No, no. And I, I think the issue is not um, working. I mean, unless you're qualified to get a $100,000 job, I don't think you need to be spending time and money getting qualified for the 100000 job. What I think you need to do is is be better at, uh, be a better steward of your time. Um, mm -hmm. For instance, um, instead of driving Uber and doing a skincare company with your cousin or whoever, I would be working at Walmart or Target or something like that, making, you know, 18, 20, $22 an hour. And then they're going to offset by paying for college tuition. If you need some additional training, any kind of training, tuition towards that training, I'd be looking into these big companies that are offering this because you may need that training um, to, to actually get into a more stable line of work. I don't like you taking on the risk down the line anytime soon. 
of spending $8,000 a month to get a bunch of leads. That is some high risk fishing. I don't like it. Now I'm not trying to talk you out of it, but what I'm saying is you're thinking, Ken, how can I get a hundred thousand dollar job to be able to have the money to do this? No, 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 no. What I want you to do is let's go make some more money right now. In the amount of time you're working, you need to be, have a higher rate of return on your time, which means a better part-time job, and you can get those making 20, 22 bucks an hour right now. Okay? So here's the deal. That extra money, okay, is going to go to paying off your debt quicker. We get rid of the debt, get an emergency fund in place, keep making more money, keep working up the ladder. How can I do the work, similar work that I want to do that doesn't require me to prospect every month spend an eight grand for leads? That is high risk. I don't like it. Did you know that recruiters take an average of six seconds to scan a resume? And that's if they ever see it in the first place. In fact, 75% of resumes are rejected before reaching a hiring manager. Listen, folks, if you want to get hired, you've got to make your resume worth noticing. That's why we created How to Write the Perfect Resume. This free guide will walk you through the five steps to stand out in the hiring process to get you your dream job. If you want to get started, go to kencoleman.com slash resume. Nice, Joe. I feel like we got a little 80s sitcom feel going there. Exactly. We need a segment where we guess the we guess the uh, the genre of the bump. You know, like we all kind of go, what's this feel like today? I probably shouldn't be doing this right now, but it feels right. I know my kids, my teenagers would be embarrassed. They really would be. But, you know, it is what it is. I like it, Joe. Uh, all right, uh, let's get to the phones. We're going to continue to coach you up. Let's go to Zach, who's right here in our uh, backyard, Nashville, Tennessee. Zach, how can I help? Hi, how you doing today, Ken? I'm living the dream. What are you doing? I am trying to pursue it. Good. Um, so I actually, I work in sports medicine. Yeah. Um, I've worked in, I'm an athletic trainer. I've practiced in three different professional sports two colleges, a high school. I was the director of a sports med or excuse me, a physical therapy company. Okay. And I've also worked in two clinical assistant positions, um, with orthopedics groups. And I desperately, I've tried every position that I can do in this field and I'm trying to get out of it. Um, obviously I moved to Nashville for a reason. What makes you want to get out of it? Um, honestly, I get bored at these jobs pretty hmm. quickly. Um, and there's also a very low ceiling for the ways that I can advance and move up within oh. the field. Well, let me tell you something, pal. That, those are two really good reasons. <laughs> you're bored, you. you're bored, that. you're bored and you're capped, right? I mean, the job, it, it winds up being that I started athletic training in the first place because it was, it was just something that kind of my parents thought that I would be good at. Oh, and, um, that answers my it, next question. I want to know what <laughs> led you into the field, and it feels like it was parental influence. Uh, yes. So I started college as a double major with history and theater, actually. And oh, then I hold to on. Medicine. Hold on. I know I'm doing a lot of interrupting, but it's on purpose. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. No, you don't need to be sorry. I'm sorry I'm interrupting, but we got to stay right here. Okay. I want to know if there's something significant with choosing history and theater. Was that a direction that you were thinking about or certainly a little bit more aligned with who you really are? Um, I was interested in becoming a history teacher because I knew it had some level of, I had really good history teachers and it had some level of a performance aspect to it, yep. which I enjoyed with my teachers. Mm -hmm. um, and then my mom has been a teacher for about 20 plus years. And when I asked her if she thought I should be a teacher, she told me after I'd already done a bunch of prereqs and stuff, that quote candidly i don't think you have the patience to be a teacher anyway do you think she's right um probably yeah okay so now i actually all right so we're gonna, okay so this is great this is like uh this is like when i was a kid this is like the shrimp boat scene from forrest gump you pull the big forrest net up gump. and we throw everything out except the shrimp so we're gonna throw all that stuff out and we're gonna mm -hmm. look at the word that i think is the key to this conversation and clarity mm. 
You said you were interested in being a history teacher because it was a form of performance. And I think you are a performer. I think you love performing. I think you love thinking about performing. I think any time that the pressure's on you or some eyeballs are on you, on you, you get what I call the juice. Am I yeah, right? Absolutely, yeah. Hey! So the whole reason I came to Nashville is to try and see if I have what it takes. We've to got perform. a correct answer. So you came to Nashville to perform. <laughs> In what way? What did you want to perform when you first came to Nashville? What did you, you want to do? Uh, I'm a singer-songwriter. There I it is. Piano and I sing, yeah. All right, now i got to ask the question, and there's really no way for me to to comment on your answer, but I feel like i got to ask. Are you good? <laughs> um, yeah, I. my friends told me that they wouldn't have let me move here if they didn't think that I had a chance to make it in music. I just started to put my own stuff out, and uh, I've been writing and I just started recording, but I've been writing and playing for about two years now. All right, let me ask you a question again. Are you good? Yeah, I'm pretty good, yeah. If I put a group, if I put a, a, if I put 200 people in a very intimate theater and they were all there as my guests and I said, just, just show up and, and sit there and shut up. And I, I got my guy, Zach, he's about ready to come out and perform. What's your confidence level on a scale of one to 10 that you could do a great job of entertaining those people who don't know you, don't know your music at all? What's your confidence level, one to 10? I give that like a six. Okay. 200 is well over the biggest crowd. I've only ever played in bars ah, and stuff before. Forget about the number of people. I thought that was a small crowd. Forget about the people and, and being nervous. I'm saying you just get up there and you perform. Could you entertain them? And they walked out and said, Ken, this guy's good. Could you do it? Scale of one to 10, one being no, 10 being you better freaking believe it. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think I would say 10, that I could entertain all those people. Okay. So this is a toughie, man, because... I've been trying to use your proximity principle as much Good. as I can. I, I work in Centennial Medical Park, and I walk across town to Broadway at least two to How three times a week. How much money do you make in your current job? Right now, about 54000 okay. is my salary. Here's, here's the question. This is the question that you must answer. How What must be true for you to make 54000 being in the music industry itself? I'm not talking as an artist. I mean... You are working on Music Row. You're working for a booking agency. You're doing something. You're working on a production crew. You are in the music business making 54000 What must be true? You don't have to answer that on the air. That's the homework assignment. That's the proximity principle, which says, if you're new to the program, in order to mm -hmm. do what Zach wants to do, you got to be around people that are doing it and in places where it is happening. Zach, yeah. it's really hard. It's really freaking hard to make it as a singer-songwriter in Poughkeepsie, much less Nashville. Yeah. Hey, Zach, it's really freaking hard to be 33 years of age with no training no experience to become a national broadcaster. I did. It. I know. I'm talking about me, Chachi. Oh. I was 33. <laughs> I did it. And broadcasting is as hard, if not harder, than the music business to make it. I did it. It's why I wrote the proximity principle. You got to start hanging around people that are singer songwriters, not just people that are like you that are hustling and grinding. But people that are actually doing it and winning big. If that means you got to freaking cut their grass, clean their pool, I'm dead serious. Okay. Hey. I've been applying for jobs just to be a bar back downtown, and um, get, one bar downtown just gave me my first shot to come out and play for them. That a boy. First thing, though, $54,000. Mm -hmm. Whether it's two jobs or one job, how do I make 54000 so no interruption in income, Working in the music industry. That's well, the proximity that's principle. A, that's also been a big problem for me Why? with athletic training is to try and actually get well past $54,000. I get it, but we're not yeah. talking about $54,000. I'm just keeping your income where it is right now. Do you want to be okay. a music artist or not? 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, then we're not worried about 54000 and higher. We're worried about just staying where we are. I know I'm coming at you pretty fired up, but you got to get this, man. There's only one way this happens, and that's if you burn the ships. I'm all in. And I, I, I'm not worried about how much money I'm making as it relates to advancement in my financial world. I'm worried about just making the same amount I need to make right now because at least I'm living right now. But you're already in an industry that you can't stand. You're bored. Your soul is seeping out of your body. And yet your heart knows and longs to do something very specific. And you're in the epicenter of it. My friend, it really is the proximity principle. But instead of reading about it now, you got to go do it. And so I want you to go make, if you can make 65, great. If you can make 75, great. If you can make 95, great. But it's not about that. It's about getting into the music industry. And the only way you're going to get in and get a shot is through relationships and opportunities where they know you for some other reason. They find you credible. They find you likable. And then they learn about you and they realize that you're talented. And then you got to be able to support yourself to the point where you can go gig for next to nothing. And you never know who walks into a bar one night and hears you tearing up the keys and they go, I want to meet that kid. There's no secret formula, folks. You just got to get after it. This is the Ken Coleman Show. Press on. Thanks for listening to the Ken Coleman Show. For more, you can find the show on demand wherever you listen to podcasts and watch the show on YouTube. You can also find Ken across all social media by following at Ken Coleman.